Boy, what a crazy year we've had. Can you believe what we've gone through? I, I was, I'll be honest with you, I had, you know, whenever you're asked to speak someplace, you always go back in the archives, you look for the good stuff, you know what I'm saying? You know, you're, you're pulling out the top 10, you know, and thinking, okay, which of these am I going to use? Because I want to impress the people that are here. Obviously, you know, no, I'm sure none of you ever do that, but, but I do upon occasion, and I got to thinking, you know what? I, I need to bring something fresh. I, I need to look at what's been going on. Flip, flip the mic on, thank you. All right, there we go. I, I need to find uh, what God has for us today. And, and I, I, was, I was thinking this past year, it's been some of the most challenging, this has been the most challenging year that I've had in my entire life. I, I got to thinking about it here, it, it, and everyone that's listening today here, pers personally right here, and those of you that are online, you have gone through some crazy things. We've had a pandemic. It's, they, they claim that happens like every once uh, every 100 years. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not planning on the next one. I'm not planning on being here, okay? One way or the other, I'm not going to be here. I'm either going to be in glory because I died and I went home, or I'm going to be in glory because the Lord raised me up and, and, and raptured me. I don't know which it is, but whatever it is, I'm not planning on being here for this next one. I'm just telling you that. Some of you want to be here, that's fine. You can do what you want. I don't care. Uh, but, you know, I looked at this pandemic. 30 million people have gotten sick with the COVID-19 virus. Families have not been allowed in to see their sick family members or those that have been uh, their elderly family members. You know, I have not seen my father in a year. I've not been with him personally in a year because he's in a nursing home with advanced Alzheimer's. And, and I can't see, I can see him online. I can, we, we have video calls, but I have not been able to touch him or hug him or, or you know, give him a, a, a kiss. I haven't been able to do any of that stuff because, because of what we're going through. And, and there have been over 500, almost 500,000 deaths this year as a result of COVID virus. There, there have been countrywide protests uh, for social justice and for integrity in our court systems. Uh, there have been certain instances that have been so bad that, that the anger has boiled over into uh, rioting and, and, and into destruction of personal property and, and federal buildings have been burned. There, there, there has been a countrywide uh, problem with this and, and not only has it been that but there's been a political turmoil as well this year that's been crazy who would have thought that leading all the way up to the election through the election past the election and all the way to almost the time it was time for 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 the new president to be sworn in we have we have a bunch of people storming the capitol who would have thought that I, I, I cannot believe what a, what a wonderfully crazy, unbelievable year that we've had. And I guess my question is, how do we respond to that? How, how do you and I respond to this, this nonsense that's been going on? How, how do we as individual followers of Jesus and as, as the local church of Jesus, how do we address those issues? How do we respond? And strangely enough, wouldn't you believe it? The Bible has an answer. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it, it, it has an answer. And, and, and so we're going to be talking about that today. And one of the main themes you're going to find in the Bible is that we're told to love our neighbors. In fact, it starts all the way back in the Old Testament, in Leviticus. In Leviticus 19.18, it says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge uh, against any one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. That's where it starts, all the way back in the Mosaic Law. And, and, but it gets repeated numerous times in the New Testament. Things like Matthew 19.19, 19, Honor your father and mother and love your neighbors as yourself. Uh, in, in Romans 13.9, it says, The commandments... Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, they can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians says the entire law can be summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Are, are you getting tired? Of, you get the feeling that when God repeats something over and over again, that maybe, just maybe, your responsibility is pay attention to it? Just asking... 
I, I know. I, I, I don't want to hear it either, you know, because then, and then listen to this. Matthew 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we're not, this is not going to be our main uh, passage. By the way, if you want to turn your Bibles to the main passage, we're going to be in, in Luke chapter 10 is where we're headed. But we're not there yet, okay? In Matthew 5, verse, starting in verse 43 and through 47, it says, You have heard it said to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Haven't we all heard that? Haven't we all responded that way upon occasion? Huh? Man, come on, let's be honest now. I have to put myself at the top of the list. There have been times that I've been tempted to do that. All right, but what's it going to say? But I'm telling you, this is what Jesus says. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son, S-U-N, to, ra- to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, this is Val's interpretation, big, fat, hairy deal. That, that's not in the scripture, by the way. That was my it added, you know, okay, that was my interpretation of it. What reward do you get? Are you not even like the tax collectors? They, they, they do that. Tax collectors are one of some of the worst people, you know, in, in first century. You know, they, no one liked the tax collectors. There's some people don't care. You know, I was in church years ago that we had we had some of the work for the IRS that was in our church. He was probably the most unloved person in the building. <laughs> He's a nice guy, but you know, just going, man, oh man, do, do you have to work for them? So, the issue is we greet our brothers, and, and you know. It, when we do that, we're just doing what the world does. Now, if I was going to say something to you and say, what was the passage that, that brings to mind the, the, most, the one that we always remember when it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself? And many of you are going to say, I hope, if you've been studying scripture, you're going to say, well, the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. So I thought, well, let's, let's take a look at that. In Luke chapter 10, this is where our passage is going to be today. We're going to read in a variety of spots there. Uh, let me just flip over here to this. Okay. So in Luke chapter 10, it says, uh, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, before we go there, I've got to tell you just a little bit about this. Luke is one of what we call the synoptic gospels. The synoptic go- gospels simply mean this. There, 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 there are three gospels that are very similar in the stories that they tell. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are the synoptic gospels. And so in the Synoptic Gospels, in fact, this particular passage I'm starting to read in Luke 10 here is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But then there's a portion of that that's not found in any of the others, only found in Luke. Now, what you need to know is that every time you read it from one of the other books, you get a little more information. I'm going to give you a hint as to what's going on in in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, the the powers uh, that be in, in the nation of Judah at the time are not too happy with Jesus. Now, there's different factions, okay? You've got the, the Sadducees, which is primarily made up of people who are, are uh, the priests and people who are wealthy. And, and they don't believe theologically that, that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. They believe that once you, once you live and you die, you just die. That's it. There's nothing else. And so they asked Jesus a question in Matthew that says, well, what happens if somebody gets married and the person dies and they marry someone else and that person dies and they marry someone else? And so what happens at the very end? Who, 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 do they, who are they with in heaven? And Jesus says, you don't care. That's not your theology. Why are you asking that? So there's another group. The other group is called the Herodians. The Herodians, they're kind of the royalty of the, of the, of the they, they believe in King Herod. They want to see him brought, his family brought back to be the king over all of Judea. All of the, that area in Palestine. That, that's what they, they want. And so they ask him a question about taxes. And he says, yeah, no, I'm going to, he says, I, he, you know, he does a great job with that. He says, no, no, no. You enter under Caesar the things that are Caesar, you run under God the things that are God. You remember that story, right? That's another one. Am I, do I need to just stay right here? Okay, sorry about that, folks. I thought for sure that when I was looking at online that I had some room to move, but I apparently don't. Okay, that's fine. You're just going to, I'm just going to have to be planted right here. So I'm, <laughs> I got, I got a little, little space, but not much. Okay, so the last, the last section is a, is a group of Pharisees. 
And that's what we're talking about here. This, this guy, this expert in the law, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, he says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, and he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus being a good rabbi, because rabbis always ask questions as answers. Some, I've, I've got a couple of folks here that, that go to one of my Bible studies, and, and they know that I always, I often ask them the, the question, they'll ask me, and then I'll just ask them back, right? And so Jesus does that exactly. He says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And so the, the, the lawyer says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus goes, well, you've answered correctly. Good for you. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to give you the gold star today. You get a gold star. You did all right. He says, do this and you'll live. You'll have eternal life. Now, the next passage, the next portion of verse 29 says, but he wanted, the lawyer wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And if I was going to title this message, I'd say the, the, the title of this message is, who's my neighbor? Who, who is it that I have? Because, you know, we just read some passages out of, out of the, the Sermon on the Mount. It says, you know, if you love your neighbors and hate your enemies, that's not what God says to do. He says you need to love your, your enemies. Is that really my neighbor? Now, I don't know what's going on here, but I think the, t the, the, the lawyer was thinking this. I think he was saying, this teacher is a false teacher, this, this Jesus guy. And so we need to, we need, he shows little respect for the, the law. And, and, and so I'm going to try to trick him on it. I'm going to try to show him how bad he is. And, and so Jesus ends up kind of saying, no, 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 the problem you have is one of, is one of, uh, of, uh, of moralism that we face today. It's one of the main problems we have. We, we think that we can somehow or other earn our way into heaven. And if I'm really good enough, you know, we put it on the balance on the scales, and if I do enough, then I get, I get into heaven. And if I don't do enough, well, then maybe I have to do, I don't know what I'm it's going to happen. Maybe I'm going to go to hell. Maybe I'm going to purgatory, depending upon your, your brand of religion. I don't know. Maybe. But what Jesus says, Jesus says, let me tell you what it is. He beats them at their own game. He says, have you actually looked at the kind of righteousness that is really required when you live by the law? By the way, there's 613 laws that you have to live by if you're going to live by the Mosaic law. 613. He boils it down into two. Love God, which is the vertical relationship. Love others, that's the neighbors, that's the horizontal relationship. By the way, it happens to look like a cross when you do that. Kind of interesting how that all works out. I don't know, maybe that's symbolism. So he says, who's my neighbor? He's trying to, this guy's trying to save face. He, he's afraid that he's losing face with his, and that's really important in certain parts of the world. You know, you don't want to look bad. And so he, he tried, it's, it's a throwaway. And he says, yeah, you got me. Okay, yeah, I need to love my neighbor, but what does that really mean? What does that really mean? And so Jesus goes on to talk about a story. Often when Jesus teaches, he tells stories. We call them parables, okay? But they're stories. So here's the story. It's in, in Luke chapter uh, 10, and we're going to start in verse 30. And it says, in reply, just Jesus tells him a story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, there's a couple things you need to know about that before we go any further. We're going to run out of time here real fast. I can tell you that real quick. But anyhow, we'll keep, someone's saying keep going. You are so, you're, you know, that was the wrong thing to tell a guy who likes to talk. That is so wrong. All right, so, so here's the deal. The, everything in, in Palestine, in Israel, uh, Jerusalem is always considered up, and everything else, anywhere else you go is always down. But here's the really weird thing. The distance between Jerusalem and Jericho is about, uh, about 3,000 feet difference to go from Jerusalem. Down to, now, that's only about 15 and a half miles. Can you imagine 15 and a half miles? I had a friend who, uh, can I go this far? Is this okay? I'm, I'm okay? All right. I just, just, just want to make sure I don't get in trouble. Okay. Uh, so I, have a, I had a friend who, who's now since gone to be with the Lord, but he, for a long time, he was a, a colonel 
in, uh, in the Marine Corps. And one of his jobs while he was a colonel was he, he oversaw all of the Marine uh, troops that guarded all of the embassies in the Mediterranean area. That was his job. And so occasionally he would be in, in Israel and be in Tel Aviv, and then he would, of course, he'd enjoy it. He'd take his wife with him, and they'd go over to Jerusalem and spend some time there. And he told me about the fact that he took a bike ride one time from Jerusalem down to Jericho. I go, that was cool. That must have been really cool, because it's really rocky and it's really hilly. He says, yeah. He says, I, what'd you do about, he, he says, we coasted all the way down. I said, what'd you do about the way back? He says, oh, I had him thrown in a Hummer and they drove it back to Jerusalem for me. <laughs> Can you imagine? But that, that's what, they're on their way to Jericho. It's about, a, it's a, almost a day's journey. A day's journey is roughly 20 miles. They're 15 and a half miles on their way. So they're on their way there. You just need to know that, okay? I don't know why, but I thought it was important. So they fell, and he fell into the hands of robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him, and they went away, and they left him for dead. And a priest happened to go along, uh, was going along the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. And so to uh, a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He took pity on him. And he went and he bandaged up his wounds and he poured on oil and wine, which was kind of in that day, kind of like putting on salve and kind of cleaning the wound and that sort of thing, okay? And, and when he went that way, he put him on his own donkey and he took him to an inn to take care and told him to take care of him. And the next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after this man. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense uh, that you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law, kind of, I'm sure, in, in, again, my interpretation of this, gulped, uh, I guess, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now, there's, there's so much in this. Well, what does it mean to love my neighbor? What, what, what is that word that's used there? In the Greek, it's the word agape. There's three kinds of love that are specifically mentioned in, in Scripture. One is, is a, 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 a sexual love, an er, a eros, and, and, and one is a brotherly love, and we get the word Philadelphia from that, okay? And then there's another kind of love that, is, that deals with a, a God kind of love. It's a love that's a choice. It's a love that's willing to sacrifice. It's a love that's willing to give anything in order to make someone happy and take care of them in their need. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus uses here. See, we're supposed to meet people, caring for people not only just spiritually, but also materially and economically when necessary. It's, apparently, it's not an option. Didn't you wish you, don't you wish you could opt out of certain things of the Bible? At least I do. I, I, boy, I'd like to not have to deal with that one, you know? That one, I could just, if I could put that off to the side, I'd be okay. And then God says, no, I don't think so. I think you really need to deal with this. This is important. And so that's what he does here. He says, hey, you need to do that. We need to be sacrificial. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be willing to give. It doesn't allow us, God does not allow us to limit the amount of love that we give somebody. Did, did you hear what I said? He doesn't allow us to limit the amount of love. Now, how we define that and how that works out might be different in different people in different situations. I understand that. But think about this. We're talking about a guy who's a, who's a Samaritan. What's the significance of a Samaritan? Samaritans were half-breeds. They were, they were both, they had been Israelites back in the day and they intermarried with a bunch of, see, it, back in 733 BC, the Assyrians came down and the 10, king, the 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, there were two, at one time Israel was all one kingdom and then it split into two, right? So the 10 tribes in the north got carried off into captivity, all the, all the important people. And all that was left was just some of the people, the poorer people that were left there. And then they integrated because Assyria brought people in and imported them into the country, and they intermarried, and they had their own. They had their own Torah. They had their own. They had their own place to worship. You know, they, they had their own temples, and, and so they were. And so the Jews absolutely hated Samaritans. Absolutely hated them. 
Sounds like some of the stuff that's been going on in the last couple of years, doesn't it? I, my word, what happened to us? What happened to our humanity? What happened to our godliness? I don't know. So he says, uh, I need to, you need to do something with these guys, these half-breeds, these, half these are religious heretics. And, and so that's the guy that does the help. Uh, and, and, if, and he said, you know what? Attitude produces action. This guy had cared about somebody. He had mercy on him. He showed loving compassion on this Jewish man. And we wonder what love is. I don't think Jesus could have found a more forceful way of saying what he was trying to say by saying, look, I want you to look at these two other people. There was a priest and then a Levite, the top people in the land as far as Israel was concerned. Top people in the land. What happens? They walk on by. You're right. Yeah. Why'd they do that? Well, maybe there's all, there's all kinds of speculation. And I don't know for sure if any of these are correct. But I'm going to throw a few out there and see if maybe they don't fit us today. Okay? How about this? Maybe they were scared. There's a guy beaten up. He's on the side of the road. It's a hilly country. There's robbers all around. And maybe they're thinking it's a setup. They're going to stop and help that guy, and they're going to get caught. And they're going to get robbed and get beat up. Maybe that's, maybe they were just fearful. Well, God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He should give us a spirit of what? Yeah, faith. Making sure we do things right. So, so it could be that. I don't know. That's a possibility. Maybe, maybe, maybe they just felt like they were just too busy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real busy person. And that equates into I'm really, really important. I, I, I'll tell you, give, I'll give you an example of, of a time that I did something really, I, I don't know what the right thing to do was. So for a long year, number of years, I've, I've been in the ministry over 30 years, um, and I've been a, a variety, I've had a variety of different uh, positions, and one, for a, a long time I was a, a worship pastor in se several churches uh, around the, 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 this area. And um, so one day I was driving uh, to church, and I had to get there because the service doesn't start until I'm there. The, the, I'm the, 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 the front guy, you know, I'm the guy that does all that stuff. And, and so the service can't start until I'm there. And I go blowing by this lady who had a flat tire on the side of the road. And I'm going, I wonder if I should stop. Oh, no, I got to get to church, man, because that's really important. I, to this day, I'm not sure which is the right thing to, to have done. And I'm not really always really good about seeing those kinds of things. We were on a walk a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, and in our neighborhood, and we walked out onto one of the main roads and, and walked up and down the road, and my wife says, uh, there's a lady there that's got a flat tire. Do you think you should go over and offer to help? I didn't even notice. I was so blind to what was going on. Now, these guys, they knew because they said they went to the, on the other side. But, you know, thank goodness I got a wife that said, hey, you need to actually do something that you should be doing anyhow. Pay attention, you know. She's, she's, she keeps me in line. So maybe I'm too busy. Maybe I'm too important. Maybe I, I, I'm afraid of being defiled. If you're, if, if you're a priest and you touch somebody that dies, if they de they're dead, and they don't know if this guy's dead or not, They'd be defiled ceremonially, and they couldn't perform their office. They couldn't do their thing. Same thing with the Levites. So maybe that was maybe they were concerned about that. You know, Jesus was never bothered by that. Do you know that he went out and he actually touched lepers? If you touched a leper, you were you were considered, considered ceremonially unclean. Jesus touched lepers. He had no problems. With it. He had he had no problems going with the people that that were not important as far as everyone else is concerned. He'd go with tax collectors. He'd go with people of ill repute, ill repute. He had no problem with that. Why? Why is it that we get bothered or, or people in our church get bothered when we end up being with people that are questionable? Jesus did it. Did he get questioned? Yeah, he did, sure. And, and you expect to be treated any better? Huh. Easy chair Christianity, right? Easy chair Christian. We, we, we do it while we... You know, I, I, Jesus saved me so I could sit in my easy chair. 
And I can just enjoy life. That's what it's all about. Just Jesus saved me, so I get into heaven. I got my golden ticket. I'm ready to go. I don't have to do anything else. No, that's not it. Jesus said, if they treated me this way, what do you expect them to treat you? Why is it we're surprised? Maybe, maybe they thought, I have nothing to spare. And there have been times in my life when I was that way. I, I had lived so egregiously, like that, that's a 50 cent word, egregiously. I had lived so, I had spent more than I, that I had. And I was in debt. And so when, when a need came up upon me, I had nothing to give, even, though I, even if I felt like I should give to them. I couldn't because I was, I was destitute. I was barely making ends meet. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul, as the saying goes. You know, and, and so you got to get your, maybe you just needed to get yourself in order, your, your finances, so, you, so when God said, you know what, I've given you stuff. I want you to also give it to all those that are in need. You could do that. Maybe that's what, what was going on here. I don't know. Another, maybe, we, well, you know, that person is really vile. He is really mean, and he talks nasty to me, and he says nasty things, and he's just not a person that I want to be associated with. He's angry. He's ill-tempered. He's ungrateful. And you know, Oh, I tell you what. Do you know how hard? One time I was in college. When I was in college, uh, undergrad school, I was a, a business major, and uh, I was in a, a school that uh, we had occasionally would have high schoolers living with us in the dorms. And um, there, we had this little high schooler that uh, was there on scholarship, and he was from Texas, and he, he was a Hispanic young guy. He was a lot of fun. I enjoyed him, but he, his name was Hector, and Hector needed a book for school, and he didn't have any money. And I had, was, God had blessed me with money when I was younger. I, he didn't bless me now, but he blessed me then. Primarily because I figured out that it, it, I think God had to tell, teach me that, that I'm not really good with money, and so I, when I get it, I tend to do the wrong things with it. You know, I'm, I'm sure none of you have ever done that. I know that. You guys are a lot better than I am. I understand. So uh, I decided, I felt, I felt compelled to give Hector the money for this book. It was like 50 bucks. And this was back in the 70s, so you can imagine that was quite a bit of money. So I put it in an envelope and block lettered, you know, his name on it and put it on the door so, you know, he would see it and, I, you know. And he, and he took it, and, I, and, I, and the note said something about, you know, for your, your, your book, your textbook. And so I, I came back that evening and went into the room, and I said, hey, I saw an envelope on the door earlier. What was that all about? I said, oh, man, someone gave me 50 bucks. I said, really? What would you do with it? Did you read your book? Oh, no, we went out with all my friends, and we partied. I go, Really? How about that? You know, it was really hard for me to want to give to that guy after that and try to help him out. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he just was not grateful for what God had given him. So maybe that's the case. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we just we say, you know, they're lazy. They're not doing anything. They're really not working. And God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. And, and maybe, so maybe that's the issue. I don't know. Maybe that's why we don't help people out. Although I will say this, in one other thing to consider is if that person has a family and you refuse to help them, you're not just hurting them, you're hurting people that are innocent as well. And we need to think about that. And I don't always think about that. You know, I have to be reminded of that. So maybe that's the case. I don't know. But here's, here's, this, here's the deal. We need to be concerned about people because we love them and because God calls us to love them. You know, each one of the groups of this, in this uh, story uh, has a different philosophy about the possessions. The robbers said, you know, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it from you. The, the priests and the Levites, well, there was, what's mine is mine, and I, and I have a right to keep it. And I'm not going to give it up no matter what. Samaritan, what's mine is yours if you need it. Which philosophy of possessions does Christ say should, is the one that we should practice? Which one?
Which attitude most, which attitude do you resemble the most? And which attitude should you resemble the most? Remember, Je Jesus is telling a story to a Jewish man, an expert in the law of Moses, and he tells it with a twist. Think about it for just a minute if he had told it the other way. It, what, what if the Samaritan had been the one that had beaten up and left half dead on the side of the road? And a Jewish man comes along the road and he says he has compassion on him and takes care of him. What would have been the lawyer's response? Well, I knew this guy wasn't, wasn't following the Bible. I know he wasn't listening to the law of Moses. He, there's no way in the world that, that we would have done something like that. No self-respecting Jew would have ever done such a thing as that. I can't believe that they would, ex that, that's un unrealistic. It's outrageous. It's crazy. I can't believe someone would actually do that. And why would he expect us to do that? That's not what Jesus did, is it? What Jesus did is he switched it around and he said, uh, he's asking each of us to imagine ourselves as the victim of violence, dying perhaps on the side of the road with no hope, and a Samaritan stops to help. How, how would you have wanted the Samaritan to respond? Would you have wanted him to respond to help you? Would you have been looking for some help? Yeah, I think so. Wouldn't you want him to be a good neighbor and cross, the, in, that, in that time frame, the racial divide? Wouldn't you have wanted somebody who, who, the only hope that you had was for someone who had no reason and didn't owe you anything and, and, and shouldn't have helped you, probably in all cases, who, who actually uh, owed you the exact opposite of help? What if your only hope was to get free grace from someone who had every justification based upon your relationship with him to deny you of any help at all? That's the story of the Good Samaritan. Someone who has no reason to help you decides to help you. And not because he's going to get anything from it. You see, Jesus says to him, who's your neighbor? He goes, uh, 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 the one that, that showed mercy. You know, the one that showed mercy, I guess he's the, my neighbor. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. <laughs> go and help someone that's in need. I need that. I need to be reminded of that. You know, too often my pocketbook is, is tightly closed and it's got a couple of padlocks on it too, to be honest with you. You know? Just imagine, think about for a minute, God in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, chooses to come down while we were dead in our transgressions and sin, Ephesians 2, 5. And it's by his grace that he decides to raise us up, to give us newness of life, to heal us from the hurts, from, from being beaten up on the side of the road. And he does that while we're still enemies of his. Romans 5, 10 says, For... If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, should we be saved through his life? God loved us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. What will it take for us to show that same kind of love and compassion to those around us? Now, I'm not talking about just the church. I'm talking about individually. Individually, not just the church, but maybe the church and individually. You see, if you want to practice this kind of love, 
regardless of whether you're sitting here or you're online, I have to honestly tell you that the only way that you can do that is by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He came when we were unlovely, and he died and took our punishment upon himself so that we could have a, a relationship with God the Father. The only way that could happen is if we're, tr we're truly willing to accept him as our, as our Lord and Savior, with all that that means. And so today, if you want to have, if you want to be able to show brotherly love, if you want to be able to show neighborly love to your neighbors, agape love to your neighbors, the only way that you can do that is that first thing you have to do is you have to receive that agape love yourself. So I'm going to close right now in prayer, and I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Ron, and he can do with the service as he sees fit and as he feels led. But Father, we ask today that you would help us to be Samaritans, to cross borders, to cross lines, to reach out in love, to help those that are in need, both, both physically and materially and economically, and most importantly, spiritually, Father. Because while we can do all those other things, if we don't help people spiritually, they're going to end up eternally in hell. And you came to redeem them and redeem us, to provide a way back to, your, to yourself. And so, Father, we ask for those who have never accepted Christ today, who have never said, I want to become a follower of him, that they would today uh, do so. If, if they're online, Father, I pray that you'd have them call that number so they can talk, send an email to the church so they can talk to somebody. If there's someone here today that needs to know you, may they come to know you before the end of the day. May they talk to Pastor Ron or myself or someone to find out what does it mean to be a follower of Christ and how can I become one? And we ask this, Father, in your name, in your son's name, amen.